Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, in our next session, we're going to look at crowdfunding from the perspective of the regulators. Uh, regulators have, as you all know, have loosened the rules in an effort to lower the barrier to innovation. Uh, but now, regulators are a little more nervous about how not only to protect investors from dishonest companies, um, but how to protect unsophisticated investors from themselves. Uh, we have a great panel here. Uh, joining me for this discussion is Kathy Vidal, managing partner of Winston Strawn. Um, she heads up their Silicon Valley office um, and is one of the leading patent litigators in the country. Next, we have Teresa Goody, founder and CEO of the Goody Group. She is a former attorney for the Securities Exchange Commission and is very familiar with enforcement rules. Uh, finally, we have Steve Davis of Goodwin. Steve is one of the most respected tech attorneys in New York, specializing in venture capital and corporate finance. His firm is a global 50 law firm consisting of more than 1,000 lawyers with offices in Boston, Frankfurt, Hong Kong, and London. And for those of you who can't see from a distance, the tie he's wearing is a Boston <laughs> Red Sox tie. If um, I cannot <laughs> wear a Red Sox tie two days after winning the World Series, I never will be able to. <laughs> right. Hopefully it won't be another five or 10 or 86 years so, uh, until you get to wear it again. Anyway, thank you uh, all for joining us. And um, uh, I think we'd li I'd like to start off the discussion uh, because this seems a rather pejorative about some of the downsides of crowdfunding. I'd like to start off the discussion by talking about some of the successes of crowdfunding and the JOBS Act. And uh, Kathy, you have the view in Silicon Valley. You've seen a lot of this activity in the last few years. Can you talk a bit about what your experience has been, what you've seen? So I think that you know one of the things that crowdfunding does is it does give access to capital by underrepresented groups. Uh, there are many women and minorities who are trying to get funding for their companies, and it's very difficult in Silicon Valley if you're not connected and if you don't know people. And there's, there is disruption happening out there in, in lots of different ways, obviously around technology, but even around funding. And I see crowdfunding as part of that. Um, there's other measures as well related to women trying to band together to make sure that they're creating the network so that women can get access to funding. But to me, that's crowdfunding has the potential, if it's done the right way, to give more access and allow you know, underrepresented individuals to get the funding they need. And it, that was certainly the goal of the, uh, the Jobs Act and Regulation CF at first. Um, I've spent many years in an earlier life covering the Securities and Exchange Commission and writing about accounting frauds at Enron and elsewhere. So I came to this with a slightly different mentality. Maybe, Teresa, you share some of this because you used to work at the SEC. Um, as soon as this was passed a few years ago, I thought the potential for misuse and abuse would be significant. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what you've noticed now that you and now you're in the private sector as an attorney, but uh, you used to be uh, in, you know, with, with the SEC. Why don't you tell us what you've seen from this? Well, I think there is a lot of fraud in crowdfunding, um, although I am very much in favor of crowdfunding, not only because I think it's necessary for startups to be able to get that capital, but also it gives non-accredited investors that opportunity to get in early, which they don't generally have. But I think that there is a lot of fraud and people seem to be mistaken about what fraud is. And fraud is material misstatements or omissions. And so, you know, when you have financial documents that are only reviewed rather than audited, that opens up the opportunity for fraud in the financial statements. And then also, people see these as selling documents. And so you're allowed to have some puffery. You know, I have the best uh, muffins in the East Coast. You know, obviously, it's, it, that's puffery. But when you say, I'm going to be the next Facebook, or I'm going to, you know, make this company up until Apple, or, or you know, there's, there's statements that go beyond that. And almost most of the crowdfunding that I just go and I look at has a lot of fraud in it. Just the statements are, go beyond puffery. And so there needs to be protection for those investors. And also the use of proceeds. How are you going to use this money? Um, we're starting to see some SEC enforcement actions here looking into it. And I think um, as this continues to develop, we're going to see more of the fraud that's going on in crowdfunding. And so it's, I think it's important um, as this evolves to try and, and, and find a way, you know, obviously getting a lawyer involved would be helpful, just in ensuring that you have these risk factors there and explaining to the people who are making the offering, this is not a selling document, this is a disclosure document, this is a protect yourself document. If anybody comes back to you and says, you know, I lost all my money, you can point to a risk factor and say, 
and right here I told you that you could. And so, you know, to see it that way rather than a document that's selling, I think would be helpful. Uh, I, do, I do just want to say with respect to that, you know, go before, you know, crowdfunding, you know, the form of disclosure of, you know, a, a, you know in an IPO, the registration statement, where you had teams at the SEC, both on the corporate finance side and the accounting side, really just going through reviewing very, very carefully. You go through the comment process. So at least there was a review period. You know, with, with Regulation CF, there's no SEC review. You have to follow, you know, it's typically posted on the website, the portal, you know, description of the company and things that you have to say. I find one of the ironies, you know, the Jobs Act is really an amalgamation of several pieces of legislation. It was the Crowdfund Act when it originally came out, and everything in Congress, when you come out with something, you have to come out, it has to be an acronym, right, an acronym. Yeah, it was capital raising online while deterring fraud and unethical non-disclosure. But, you know, the system's not set up for that. You know, for regulation CF, and we can talk about other forms of crowdfunding, it, it's, it's actually set up for, I guess, capital raising as a last resort, right? You know, for an early stage company, you go through friends and family, you go through angels, you go through institutional investment, and that's broad. I mean, you know, the amount of available <coughs> capital is huge. But there are many more companies looking for money than there is available from those sources. And you have to go, you know, for somewhere else. Right. So yeah, the, gotta go the goal else. of this was to expand the classic friends and family money and open that pool up to a wider number yeah. of. Yeah. And, and, and frankly, you know, philosophically, and I understand, you know, giving uh, non-accredited investors an opportunity to invest in what really is the riskiest corporate investments one can make. And when you think about it, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission was created in 1933. That was in the, the, you know, the height of the Depression. That started off with a stock market crash that wiped out 90% of, of, of Wall Street. Literally 90%. People got wiped out. There was no federal regulation. So the SEC was created to protect investors. And, you know, this is a major, I think, you know, kind of a major step back. It's far easier. I was saying, you know, before we met, to go to your rich Uncle Harvey and look for a check, one single check for, nine, you know, for a couple hundred thousand dollars than it is to go through, I think, a crowdfunding campaign for the same amount of money. Yeah. And I will not, you never underestimate, never underestimate, by the way, the value of college reunions. Because <laughs> the guy who lived across the hall from you may be a retired Goldman Sachs partner looking to diversify investments. And being able to do it that way is just a lot easier than uh, crowdfunding. Okay. Uh, college reunions, good, good yeah. advice. Um, uh, one of the issues I think we've discussed earlier was in terms of the SEC and some of the actions they're taking is that it's literally impossible for the SEC to police this area. There's just so much small activity. We have no statistics. We have statistics on accounting frauds, you know, actions the SEC takes against public companies, but there's no, no, no possibility with their limitations. They have trouble covering the, the public markets as it is. Uh, they're stressed, you know, strapped in terms of funding. So the idea that the SEC could play a, a realistic role in enforcement in this area, I think, is um, it's kind of a caveat emptor or, you know, yeah. you, you well, know, even the public market, risk. they rely on civil litigation, right? You know, the, the private litigation, class action lawsuits, derivative lawsuits. And whistleblowers have actually really helped a lot in policing yeah. the markets. There's a lot yeah. more whistleblowers now. And I think the fact that the SEC is starting to look into these, that companies are now aware, I could just be that one unlucky person right. who, who gets caught. But I think once these actions, we start seeing them play out in the regulatory um, administrative proceedings and in court, I think that we will start seeing a lot of the education that has to take place. I don't think a lot of the fraud is actually purposeful. I think a lot of it is just, they just don't know. And right. even companies that I, I mean, that I deal with and I help them do a raise, they just really, they don't know what their rights or what their duties and obligations are. And so it's that education going through with them that I think is important, which will come out when people are penalized 
you know, yes. that's really when you'll get that. So I want to focus a little bit on some of the success stories that uh, we've seen. So Kathy, can you tell us about uh, your experience in Silicon Valley <laughs> and some examples of uh, either successful crowdfunding or just, you know, how this has actually filled a real need, a hole in the, uh, in the whole food chain or in the whole growth stages? So I, I think it can fill a hole. I think it's a little too early stage to see a lot of success stories. We did hear about some earlier today, but I think I think the concern is the risks go beyond the SEC. Uh, there are a lot of other risks uh, by virtue of the fact that, first off, you try and do crowdfunding and you don't get the money. That's a huge negative. If you get the money, uh, it's still a stigma against you because there's a presumption that you tried to get it from the VC community and you were unable to, and you had to resort to crowdfunding. Um, if you do get the money, uh, that doesn't mean you're a success. I mean, it all depends upon how we label success. I mean, we, we saw Pebble, they raised $43.4 million. You'd think that would be a success. But where are they today? They sold off their assets to Fitbit. So, you know, and they raised more than any other company. So they raised $43 million, but they, they it wasn't had enough. no plan. It's not, it's not enough. The money is not enough. Like, this is, this is a great first start. Um, I do think we're starting to see some stopgap measures here. Uh, you know, we heard earlier about I Fund Women. You know, so they're not only providing the money or the, the mechanism to get the money through crowdfunding, but also the support structure around it. You know, something like what you might get with an interested investor and what you're going to get from a venture capitalist that wants to protect their money. So I think what we're going to start to see is, you know, things are going to shape around crowdfunding to maybe offer the complete package, but we're not there yet. Um, so that's, that's, that's my concern. So I'm not seeing as many successes as I am, you know, access to money. The, the money you get is usually, you know, five to 10,000 uh, at most. Per I mean, investor. What, per, what are you gonna, well, companies aren't raising that much. I mean, a lot of companies are raising small funds to just get things kicked off, and that's, and that's about it. Um, and, and a lot do, to, does depend upon the business model, the industry, what yeah. the company is, because yeah. you have some software companies or probably, the, you know, the most prevalent, you know, is, are applications, you know, apps. Mm -hmm. And not enough, you know, you don't have to raise yeah. that much mm -hmm. money to, to <coughs> develop, commercialize, launch, and potentially be a, um, you know, a acquisition target. And I've seen a couple companies, too, where you know they had gotten these great contracts to sell their products in huge stores, but they needed the inventory, and it was very close, and they couldn't get the money anywhere else through crowdfunding. They were able to quickly raise the money, get their products, get enough to get that cycle going of revenue in, being able to buy their inventory. So it was that that little infusion that they needed right then and there that got them on their cycle, so that they could actually succeed. And so, I mean, it's, I think it's huge for those kinds of companies. Well, and even the cap of a million, well, now it's a million 70,000, um, that, that's not enough to take you all the way, usually. You know, even if it is an app, there's, you've got to hire programmers. I mean, there's, there's a lot that you need to do to start a company. So if you are crowdfunding, that's not the end of the day. You still have to go to the venture capitalists and explain why you did crowdfunding in the first place. And, and, and you've got a lot of different disparate investors. Yeah. You know, that, and, and it could be a mess in terms of what agreements you have with those investors. Um, and I... You know, we've all read this. The the message to investors in these is 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 very much be careful, do due diligence. The more you know about the subject, the better, et cetera. But um, just the mythology of the stock market and the wealth that's been made back in the dot com bubble, et cetera, is such that I think everybody with a little you know enough to play ball thinks they have a chance at mm -hmm. you know hitting the home run here. Um, I'm old enough to remember the TV commercials and the dot-com boom and the truck driver, the tow truck driver who bought an island in the Pacific and, <laughs> and all that. And there's that, that taps into, you know, a lot of mom-and-pop investor mentality that, you know, there, there, there is a, a, an opportunity to hit the home run, the grand slam, if you, um, if you do it right so, uh, or if you pick the right one. Uh, so, unfortunately, there, you know, bad actors can, you know, take advantage of that mentality. Um, I would imagine there's a concern if there, there comes to be a few cases that get highly publicized of fraudulent activity that that will hurt the entire industry. You, you, well, yeah, maybe you know, create a lesson for those who are actually looking for crowdfunding. I think with the, you know the SEC is no matter wh whether it's been inside of trading, for example, do something that's very very high profile, high visible, high profile, and make that the deterrent for you know, the others who the SEC just doesn't have the resources uh, to go after. And I think you know, the same thing if it's you know, publicized yes. you know, could so be Steve, helpful. I want to talk a bit about your corporate experience yeah. because you do a lot of work in Europe as well, do you not? 
I, I, uh, I personally people. don't. The firm does. I okay. personally don't. Um, how, at, at your level, doing, uh, you know, well, how do you see crowdfunding? I, I, crowdfunding. We, we talked earlier about some of the pessimism you have towards it in general. Yeah, and, and that, you know, and you, you kind of have to, I think, bifurcate a little, too, uh, because there are different, as I mentioned when I first started, there are different types of, quote, crowdfunding. You know, um, Reg D, you know, was expanded under the Jobs Act to permit public solicitation. Uh, on 506C, you know, and that what that did, but it was still accredited investors, but that led to angel list and seed invest and platforms like that being organized, which at the time were just for angel investors. Under you know under 506, there's no limit on how much you can raise. Uh, there's no limit on how much an investor can invest, and you're exempt from uh, state uh, regulation. You know, all those being very very important. Uh, regulation A plus, um, and we've you know, we've done several of those deals. It's kind of like a quasi mini public offering. Uh, you file an offering circular, not a registration statement. It does get reviewed, you know, by the SEC. Uh, however, the level of review isn't anywhere close to what it would be for an S one, you know, going the traditional way. And under Reg A plus, there are two tiers. Tier one, you can raise up to 20 million. Tier two, you can raise up to 50 million dollars. So it's a significant amount. The real estate industry has really used that as a major source of their private fundings for real estate projects, and they've been quite <coughs> successful. I know our real estate group has done a, a, a lot of them, and the crowdfunding sites have been very successful as well. And so far, I haven't heard of any of the you know fraud claims. You know, maybe because when you're dealing with a real estate project, you know, there's only certain information, and real estate investors are more sophisticated, uh, and they are you know accredited investors. And then you have, of course, you know, the regulation CF, where you're limited in amounts. You know, the non-accredited investors are limited to what they can do, and and um, you know one. And it was successful. Company raised, it, uh, raised um, you know, the maximum they could raise under it. It was for a mini gasoline engine, you know, engine e efficient engine company that was having a lot of difficulty raising uh, money through um, you know, institutional investors, and, and we raised the maximum. But this is going to be a company. I mean, we wound up 980 investors. 980. That's a lot. I mean, there were checks for hundred dollars the company was, you know, was collecting. A lot in the, you know, the, the, the next financing is really going to be a strategic investor, and not an, you know, not an institutional investor. So, you know, with respect to this, there are, you know, a lot of different avenues. Um, you know, Regulation CF is still developing. Um, you know, the amounts that are being raised, particularly by tech companies, are not outstanding. I mean, I think we're going to have this year an institutional investment, not crowdfunding, but regular VC investment, probably the biggest year ever. It's going to eclipse 2000 in the height of the dot-com era. And you, you, we, we are having a lot of the unicorns and decacorns raising, you know, billions in their private financings, which get added to that. But... Um, uh, you know, there's just, you know, it's an alternative. And I like to think for a company, at least Regulation CF is, um, you know, last resort. Uh, Kathy, the, the, right, this goes to the point you made earlier about the view among venture capitalists of this being the lowest source of funds, that if you're out begging on crowdfunding, there must be something wrong with the business model, et cetera. Is this going to change at all? How do you see that attitude evolving? So... And I do have that concern. I, I have that concern in part because if you're not getting venture capital funds, there may be a reason. You know, I do think crowdfunding, you do get market validation. You know, often it's consumer-facing products and you get market validation, but you're not getting validation as to your business model and whether you have a sustainable business model. You know, I was mentioning that I, I just invested in a, in a company called Superphone and I put a lot of money in because Ben Horowitz invested in it. You know, that was my validation. Had they crowdsourced or crowdfunded, I never would have invested in them. So uh, I do think that there is a little bit of a disconnect and that we have to give support around the crowdfunding. Um, I know All Raise is a, um, an organization, a nonprofit that Eileen Lee started. She announced it on April 3rd of this year where she's providing that support to women-funded companies and, um, and women founders. Um, so I think if the crowdfunding 
entities get that kind of support, get that kind of validation, get the, the people in those networks together, then they can achieve some of the objectives that you would normally be able to achieve through the VC community. So I think it needs to come closer. It can't be this binary system where you fail with the VCs and therefore you're just going to go off and, and you know, get money. You really need to think about making sure you're getting all the advantages that you would have had you gone to a VC, had you been under that level of scrutiny, had you made those kind of connections. And the business support. Um, in exactly. terms of how to run something. Exactly. So maybe, maybe you crowdfund through an organization that has that support along with it, like I Fund Women. Um, I'm not part of them. I'm not trying to plug them, but I thought that was a great, uh, I thought that was a great talk. Um, or, or you look for other support in the community. I mean, I'm sure there are other organizations that are out there to support diverse companies, to support companies generally. Um, your Eileen Lee's organization can help support women. So you just need to make sure you're getting that support so that you actually have a real success. You don't have a pebble success where you right. tout the money you raised and then you know you have in no pro. paycheck at the end of the day. Um, you've got a real success get, and a real operating company I guess going forward. It. If we get a Facebook or any of these companies that started in a garage and then they're they're funded through crowdfunding and they go on to become a big star, that will actually be a you know a huge have an have an impact well, in the community. That'll be the validation, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Be absolutely. The and I think part of it, you know, also, I mean, just because you crowdfund, is that a death sentence? Absolutely not. You know, it requires execution. If you can execute, mm -hmm. if you can take the money you've received, you know, in that mm -hmm. funding and and advance the company, I think that trumps everything. And if those legislative proposals start coming through to make it so that investors can go into a special purpose vehicle and then you have that one investor, so they'd be exempt from being an investment advisor, and then you have basically one investor on your cap table yeah. rather than 980, right. I mean, that might help as well. Uh, and Teresa, I wanted to come circle back to you on the SEC again, just in terms of um, I, I, am I mistaken or they've, they've made noises? There have been some discussion about how they're going to be more aggressive about this. And you know from having worked there, uh, mm -hmm. sometimes the statements are just that warning so that people are on notice and you know we're watching you even though you don't have the, the bodies there to actually watch. But are you getting any sense that there is going to be more aggressive enforcement in this area or that they will try to pick off one or two? I'm examples? seeing enforcement actions myself. So I'm, I'm a you know, defending and part of some enforcement actions against crowdfunding um, offerings. And so they are active in these investigations and they are looking into them. And, and it just, they, give, they gave everybody a little bit of time and now they're starting to look into them and they're actually investigations that will probably end up in, you know, some of them in enforcement actions. Um, I think it, we might see another 21A report, which is their re report of investigation that they often do as a way to describe what the rules and obligations are without penalizing anybody. And, and from what I've seen, they really don't want to penalize or make it very costly for these small companies. So anybody who's been a part of an SEC investigation, it is very time consuming and very costly when they start issuing even voluntary requests. I mean, there's a certain way that you have to get all of the metadata to them. I mean, it's just very costly in reviewing everything and you have to have lawyers review things. You never hand anything over to the government that your lawyer hasn't looked at, you know? So um, it's very costly, but they're being very sensitive to that and they wanna see crowdfunding, you know, succeed. I think, but just succeed in a way that is also protecting investors and creates efficient markets. But they want to see, I mean, this is a good capital raising initiative. And these are the, tri the three missions of the SEC.